on sports. All right. Good evening. Did you see I have my Corona's beard going on here? Uh, nice. Very nice. Well, since NHL people can't uh, grow the beard at this point, I guess they can, but what's the purpose? There is no Meaning. playoff at this point. Right. You know, so I'm going to take up the, the hall for them. It's my part. It's what I can do in this time of crisis. You know, I don't use the word hero very often, Dave, but there you go. Can I show you some? Can I show you oh, some? Please, please. Yeah. Have you seen this book? Oh, lovely. Lovely. It's release day, baby. I know, I know. Ooh, it's release day. People can buy it. They can buy it. Oh, man. Uh, we we can pretend we're signing it. <laughs> I like it. I like it. So, happy, happy release day. You know, unfortunately on release day, we, we lost uh, one of my favorite players of all time. Another, another one of the so-called uh, baseball cards that, that kills me every time they die. The, the cards of our youth, so to speak. Yep. Mm -hmm. K-Line. Uh, Certainly, Mr. Tiger, one of the one of the game's greats, and, and from all accounts, a better person than he was a baseball player. And he was a hell of a baseball player. My uh, my cousin Paul was from Detroit, and we would always argue about who was better, you know, Clemente or Kaline. And I remember one day feeling really distraught and coming to my mom and saying, "You know, I think maybe Paul's right." And she said, "What are you talking about?" And I held up a battery, and I said, "They named this battery after him. This Cal <laughs> K Line battery. True story. Al True K story. Cal K Line. Oh man, that is good. It's classic. Well, I too. I, I, I also have a, a Detroit story about uh, Tom Dempsey, who we lost uh, yesterday. Wow, rough weekend, man. It was a rough weekend. We we lost him to the to the virus." Um, but I remember my cousin calling me from Detroit. He was a Detroit fan. And he said, you know, I was, I was what, eight or nine at the time? Yeah. But he knew I, I was getting into football. I was a sports guy even then. And he said, Jesus, you know, I'm laughing at the TV because this guy with a half foot comes in to kick a 63-yard field goal. And I'm laughing, thinking, what the hell are they even thinking? You know, we got this game in the bag. And all I remember is screaming and throwing something at the TV because this son of a bitch with a half foot kicked the field goal and we lost the game. Well, that, that certainly has to be one of the more remarkable, memorable mem uh, records in NFL history. Well, you know, you think about all he accomplished in the, in the NFL and given that handicap, it's, it's incredible. It I mean, is. I heard a couple of people today just talking about Hall of Fame worthiness for him. And I thought, well, that's that's an interesting thing. I never really thought about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure he's there, but you know what? I mean, he he was. It was a hell of a record. It was a memory. It was a hell of a memory. It was. And uh, it was one of my first true NFL memories. Um, but uh, we got that, and certainly it just came across. I I don't know how serious it is, but. Uh, our, our boy, old Terry Hanratty, apparently is suffering with the virus. Oh, so, didn't see that one. That just came across there. So, well, you know, that, that's sort of a, a, a segue into what we're going to be talking about tonight, too. It certainly. certainly you, know, you think is. about this. What you know? What if the Steelers don't win that coin flip? And yeah. With, with the right to draft Terry Bradshaw. Right. Your quarterback is Terry Hanratty. Yeah. I think that's a huge what if, uh, because Terry Hanratty is just a great guy, and, and uh, you know, cer certainly, uh, certainly one of the good ones out there, but not as a quarterback. No, no. He, although he, he had an impressive college career at Notre no, Dame. No, I was, I was just about to say that he was one of the the, the great Notre Dame all time quarterbacks. Certainly the leader of that national championship 1966 club. Mm -hmm. Injured for the famed 10-10 uh, tie against. Oh, that's right. He was out that game. You're right. I forgot. What if he's not injured? 
What if he's not injured? It's a blowout, and there's and there's no controversy. There's no controversy. He was good. He was on that team with with the Rock, Rocky Blyer. Yes, that's the beautiful thing about sports. You know, a bounce here, a bounce there, and you can play this whole what if game that we're going to be playing tonight all the time. Well, and we are, and and that's that's certainly uh, the basis of a lot of conversations we have, and. And Gary, who unfortunately, uh, uh, due to work, is not uh, not going to be able to join us tonight. But um, you know, certainly conversations we have, and, and interesting as hell conversations that we had. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm gonna we're gonna start off with with uh, with that Steeler. They do win the toss. They do get Terry Bradshaw. Right. Um, and they do finally break the the 40 year hold on not winning a title of any kind and win the Central Division in 1972. And then they play a little game against the Raiders in the playoffs, their first playoff game since 1947 when they lost to uh, uh, the Eagles uh, uh, 21 to nothing at Forbes Field, which I'm sure there's a lot of what-ifs about that season. Um, but, uh, you know, they what make the coach play. doesn't die, you know? If the coach doesn't die, this isn't as big a deal. You're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Because he wins, he gets to that point without a great team. It's a team of no names, no stops. Um, you know, but uh, uh, we get down to 72. Mm-hmm. Seven to six. You know the story of uh, of old Dommy uh, taking us uh, out of there because he hates traffic. I, I know it. You know, and he's not as upset the rest of his life if Franco drops the ball. So Franco, I mean, much has been said about that. Mm -hmm. That that game gave him the confidence to be champions. So if Franco doesn't drop the, if Franco drops the ball and it's a disastrous loss, does that affect them two years later? Well, that's interesting. It's going to affect probably their draft order. So the '73 draft, who they? I'm trying to remember who they did drafted in '73. Was that Dave Brown? Uh, I think it was Dave. I think it was Dave Brown, yeah. So it affects that. Uh, maybe it does. I don't know. I mean, or is this a team that was just happy to be there? We don't know. But, you know, then, then let's go to the following week. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it leads into it. And, and I, to be honest, I, I don't think it, it has much an effect because they, they have a disappointing 73 season anyway. Right. Um, right. So but the I, next week, they're, they're – they're, playing going toe-to-toe with the Miami Dolphins the undefeated Miami Dolphins which frankly it it still blows my mind that the way the league was that time that they just had where the title game held just revolved by the by the comp by the division as so here we have the undefeated Miami Dolphins coming to Pittsburgh with no home field advantage that still just boggles my mind that 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 was the way it was done back then don't don't forget we we gave them a present of a of a 60 degree day at the end of December. Well, that's true. That, yeah. That's true. The, the other part of it, though, is, you know, the Steelers are playing with them pretty well. Um, if not for a, a fake punt that they, did, they were unable to, to deal with by Larry Seipel, they might have actually upset the Dolphins that game. So huh? you have no Dolphins undefeated. You, have, you don't have any undefeated teams then. Yeah. No, no, you don't have any undefeated teams. Um, you're playing Washington, which um, I, I think the Steelers were a better team than Washington um, at, at that point. But the game is to set it up. The game is 7 nothing. Pittsburgh's leading. Um, Jerry Mullins uh, uh, dives on the ball in the end zone to give him a lead in the first quarter. And Steeler defense is playing well and really stopping uh, a very potent Miami running attack, which – right. Still, I consider one of the great running attacks of all time. Uh, between kicks, you had a three-headed monster there. Absolutely, not a two-headed monster, but a three-headed monster. Three-headed monster, fun, fun to coach in computer football. Yeah, because you can't stop. Them. Yeah, no. But they're, they're at about the 50, 49-yard line, something like that, in the second quarter with a fourth down. And Larry Seipel, who is now one of the bastards in in uh, Pittsburgh sports history takes the ball and runs it 37 yards downfield. They score a play or two later um, with Morrill hitting Larry Zonka from the nine-yard line. And uh, 
instead of having a seven nothing halftime lead, you're you're the game is tied. Momentum is now on on uh, Miami's side. Although I, I here's where I have the problem. I mean, the Steelers come back, they regroup, they drive down. Jarella puts them up ten to seven in the third, and pretty much after that, so you've had enough time for the Steelers to disintegrate. They don't up front, but I think that running game just kind of wears down the Steelers as the game goes on. And don't, yeah. don't forget the Al Young pass, if I'm not mistaken, was really late in the game. It was. Um, so I guess in my point, I I still think even, even if they get him there, yes, you have a chance to pull the upset, no doubt. But I still kind of have a feeling that Miami is going to figure out how to win that game. Well, I also think we probably spared one of the worst Super Bowls that ever could have happened. Two hapless offenses like that. That would have been brutal. Yeah. And, and you can see Roy Jarella trying to make the same kind of pass that Gary. <laughs> Roy Jarella, the worst yeah. postseason kicker or Super Bowl kicker in the game's history. Absolutely. Oh, he broke his ribs on the one, didn't he? Uh, trying to make a play on a special teams. Yes, he did. He was the epitome of a hack, my friend. He was indeed. He was indeed. But um, I, I well, let's let's stay in the, let's stay in that same era. Okay. Um, let, let's go back a year, 1971. A couple things from that one. Great, one of the great World Series that we'll ever see. I mean, yeah. and I would say that even without the Pirates winning. But what if they didn't win? I mean, it was Clemente's crowning achievement in his career. He became a national icon for his performance in that World Series. But if Baltimore wins game seven, does he still get to be the MVP? See, or is, is he pull a Bobby Richardson? I, I, I mean, when Richardson got the MVP, don't forget, he set all kind of personal records uh, for World Series records. I'm sorry. I don't know. Clemente, that Clemente was one hit short of what he did. I know, I know, but I, I don't know that he has that kind of series. Don't, don't forget, it has to – you have to be so far above everybody else. And I don't I, – McNally ends up 2-1, and one, minuscule ERA. Um, if I was voting, I would have voted for him at Pittsburgh, not one. Or I, Frank I Robinson, I, Brooks Robinson, both had great series. But what – Here's one you said to me. What about Earl Weaver in Game 7? What happens? Well, that's tell, a, tell your story on that one. Well, Earl Weaver, uh, in the first inning, Steve Blass is all over the place. He, he looks, he's, he's admitted in a pregame interview to not getting much sleep the night before. He, he's admitted to being too excited, and he, he shows it. He, he, he's wild. Um, it's looking like he's going to fall apart, and Earl Weaver thinks that. So he comes out with Rule 803, which keeping your foot on the rubber uh, before you throw the pitch. So he comes out and he tries to shake up Blast by complaining to the umpire at that point that this is this has happened. So as Steve Blast explains it in interviews I've had with him afterwards, that calmed him down. It had the reverse effect on what Earl Weaver was right. trying to do, and. You know, he comes out, he bounces a pitch. As I don't know if you remember that in, in the warm-up. Yep. He bounces a pitch, then gives up a titanic foul to Boog Powell, Boog Powell. Then he digs in. And I truly believe this what if. I, I believe Blast when he says that. If Earl Weaver, Weaver doesn't come down, don't forget, Quayer only gives up two runs that game. That's right. So even if he calms down in the second or third inning, I, I do think, the Pirates lose that game if Earl Weaver does not come out of there and Blass has a chance to think about it and calm down. Um, so to me, that is a, that is a very, very um, important what if. Um, well, let's stay with Steve Blass a little bit. So 1972, he has a career year, wins 19 games. 73, he develops what is now known as Steve Blass disease, where he, he is unable to pitch strikes, he, was, he went from being the runner-up for the NL Cy Young to basically being completely ineffective in 73, 
by 74, his career is, is basically over. 1973 is a year that the Pirates are, are reeling from the death of Roberto Clemente, yet they're still in the, the race until the final weekend of the season because it's a, it's a bad, bad Mets team that actually wins mm. and actually goes to the World Series. The Pirates finished, I believe, what, four games behind, something like that. What if they had an effective Steve Blass that year? Oh, I, the Steve I, Blass of 1972. I think they run away with the title. I, I, I genuinely do. Those are bad teams. And, <clears throat> you know, at that point in time, um, you still have it. You're, you're one series away from going back to the series. So yeah. I, I think if Steve Blass doesn't lose it, um, then the Pirates are definitely in the playoffs. I, I don't know that they're in the series. Um, I know the Mets en ended up uh, uh, with the big upset in 73, but, you know, there's, there's no saying that the Pirates, the, the Pirates wouldn't have been the most talented team on the field at that point, but they're in the playoffs without a doubt, without a doubt in my mind. Right. And, I, I agree. What do you think the effect of Roberto, his good friend Roberto Clemente's death had on? I know he denies it. I think it had a, I think it had an effect on all of them. I mean, I, I think that they all sort of slipped back a little bit. Um, certainly, uh, Sanguian was, and the whole catching situation was thrown up in the air. I mean, you had Sanguian starting in right field, yeah. with Milt May then becoming the full time catcher. And that didn't last very long. No. Um, you also had some other injuries, um, but you also saw the the first uh, sighting of Dave Parker was in absolutely. In no, I, I, I think Steve Blass makes a difference because it, it wasn't a stellar staff without him in there. No. Um, so, yeah, I, without a doubt, he makes a difference in there. And, and you know, quite possibly, don't forget, he's, he's just getting into his peak there. Right. Does that make a difference in 74 or 75? Well, you, you know what? It, it actually could. I mean, maybe some of the deals that they make, too, to, to bolster up their pitching staff, they, they don't need to do. No, no, and and you know, take it one step further. They're the they win a third World Series at, at some point in there. They're the team of the decade, right? Or at least mentioned with the A's. But the fact that they, to me, the fact that they would have done it really with three separate teams, to me, would have been an advantage over over the A's when when coming to that. Yeah. Plus, you know, when the A's died, they died. Yeah, and they went quickly. Yeah. I mean, they, uh, they really did. I mean, that, that Pirate team was pretty much competitive every year of that decade. Yeah. No, it was the greatest, uh, certainly the greatest moderns. I, I, I still think the first decade of the 20th century is you win four pennants. and, and um, Yeah, I agree. You have your most successful teams in the franchise's history at that point. Um, but, you know, would it have been the greatest decade? Had the Pirates sign a crop of players in 1938 that were offered to them? Yeah, I mean, you had a sports editor from the, um, the Pittsburgh Courier yeah. making the suggestion. I mean, and, and remember, Dave, at that point, Pittsburgh was the epicenter of the Negro Leagues. I mean, oh. you had the Crawford, you had the Grays. You had the best talent in baseball, in black baseball. And, you know, you can make the argument that a lot of those players were much better than anything that uh, – the white leagues were fielding at that time and, and Pittsburgh would have the advantage in signing them because well, they were local at that point. Yeah. I mean, Chester Washington basically offered them um, Ray Brown, who, who was a tremendous pitcher at the time. You know, certainly a guy that doesn't get a lot of credit, but he, he certainly was probably better than anything they had for sure. But then they, they bring up Satchel Page, greatest pitcher in the history of the game. Many, many say. Right. Uh, and he, in his prime, Dave. His prime, his prime. Say, he was in his prime at that point. And then three players, Josh Gibson, who, I, I mean, where Bob Feller mentions the fact that we might not have seen an effective, or as effective Josh Gibson because he couldn't hit his curve. Most people couldn't hit his curve. When you see what Negro League players did once they got to the majors and knowing that Josh Bell or Josh Gibson was here, yeah. Compared to um, the rest of them here, there's no doubt in my mind he becomes an MVP candidate every year when he's there. 
You got Buck Leonard, one of the great power hitters in the history of the game, so consistent over the years. And Cool Papa Bell, who, who was a mean personified, fastest guy in the history of the game, if you believe the account. You put those in the lineup, you're not talking about the New York Yankees in that era at, at that point. Plus, none of these guys went to war. So you're you're looking at at sustained success throughout the war years too. Well, I'm also going to, I'm going to throw the other factor in there. You have the earlier Clemente factor because then you would have African-American ballplayers who would want to play for yeah. the Pirates because they were the team that started it all. So Absolutely. yeah, I mean, it would, have, it would have been a completely different era in Pittsburgh sports. Now, who's, if the Pirates doing that, obviously some of the other teams are going to follow suit, but for at least the one to two years, the Pirates would have the advantage. Exactly. And even, even if they followed suit, you're still talking the cream of the crop. Yeah, so, you are. You know, you're talking follow suit with, you know, the, the dregs of society, so to speak. Yeah, um, you, you, got, you got your B list coming in. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Absolutely. So I, I, I mean, that makes a huge difference in, in what we're talking about here um, when, it, when it goes uh, uh, to things. Um, you know, of course. They weren't offered a David Bullock. Oh, 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 no, they were not. They were not. You, you remember the scene uh, throughout the Penguins' history, except for one year. Um, this team was the albatross around Pittsburgh's necks. Not only would they lose, I mean, in 75, you become the second team in professional sports history to blow a 3 nothing lead in the playoffs against the Young Islander team. And then you, it was 80 or 81, I think it might have been 81, where you had a, a lead against them in a fifth and deciding game, and the Islanders just blow over you over the next, last few minutes of the game to lose that uh, series. Well, and also the, the, the key goal bouncing off of Randy Carlisle to, exactly. to, to tie the game. Exactly. I mean, you derail a dynasty at that point if you just hang on. Yeah. Um, so it's looking that way when I, the best team that we've ever put on ice in, in a season, 1993 Penguins. At that point, um, you're looking like you're, you're going to just crush these guys. Second round, um, you beat the Devils in the first. And you're having a lot of trouble with them. I mean, game seven was a bad memory, but don't forget game six where you fought back to tie the game at the end of the second period, only to blow it in the third period and lose seven to five. Well, don't forget game seven too. They were down. They even forced the overtime. Was oh, yeah. amazing. Well, you, you score what twice in the last three and a half minutes. And, yeah. and you're looking like you're doing a reverse on them. Okay. And Lemieux hits the post. In overtime. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, David Bullock did not hit the post. He did not hit the post, my friend. He and did not. But I don't think any – if they get past the Islanders, I don't think anyone stops them. Well, they, they should. I mean, you, you got the Kings and Toronto. Um, Toronto blowing uh, what they thought was going to be uh, an easy uh, victory in game six and, um, and then losing uh, by goal in game seven. I think it was Gretzky that hit – I'm not mistaken. Yep. Hit the, um, the winner. Yep. You were out there at the time. Yep. Yep. So, um, now you are playing. Uh, I mean, Montreal was was a nice team that year, and I I looked up their run through the playoffs before we got on there. They they were 12 and four in the playoffs. So or 16 and four. So they they would have given. I think the Penguins beat them. I agree with you, but. I also think they would have given the Penguins a run for Oh, yeah. Them. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't disagree with that. But I, I just think that, that was, that's the best Penguins team we've ever seen. No, no, it is. And, you know, you get back. I mean, the West, the West was, not, was not great that year. I mean, even no. with Gretzky with, with Los Angeles, I don't think Los Angeles is, is, uh, is that great a team. But, but 75. Or, or 73, the first one, when they were, when they were down, they lose those 75, two games. yeah. 74, Here's 74. the thing about it, though, Dave. I mean, keep in mind that when the Islanders go on 
and the same thing happens in the next round against the Flyers. They go down 3 nothing. Yeah. And they battle back to force a game seven. Only this time, the Flyers win that game seven. I don't know that the Penguins matched up well against that Flyer team. So I don't know that that, that, that uh, season goes much longer than that round. But uh, I think that had a lot to do with the rise of the Islanders because they had that confidence of it, both of those series yeah. being written off, but coming back and making, making, you know, one time, you know, winning and the other time really pushing it to the brink. Well, I agree with you. I, I do think it had a lot with that, but, but I also think if the Penguins win one of those last four games, I don't think they go, they go bankrupt a year later. Well, that's true. Because you're, you're talking at least, uh, at least three more um, home games there. You're talking an inter, you're, you're in the semifinals. You're not expected to beat the Flyers. This is, this is beyond what you're expected to do have, have done. So the interest in the Penguins probably shoots up. Um, and you have three more home games to generate revenue to perhaps not be, um, not go bankrupt. So right. that, that loss potentially lost the Penguins to the city. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to throw a what if in here for you, Dave. What if the Penguins never came to the city? Well, and here's how that might have happened. It's something that actually you discovered while doing some research. Exactly. I'll let you, I'll let you take it from there. Well, you know, we were, uh, I was, um, when I had a break from work, uh, I was trying to complete my Civic Arena chapters. And one of them was on the return of the Hornets. The Hornets, of course, uh, leaving the city for five years after the Duquesne Gardens uh, uh, were destroyed in, um, in 1956, and there was no place for them to play. Um, so I was doing research, the return of them, uh, Civic Arena, AHL grants them the uh, right to bring the Hornets back. And I see a little thing in, in the bottom where it says, you know, that this man, John H. Harris, who ran the Duquesne Gardens and, and uh, owned the Hornets, got 36 dates for hockey and basketball. So I'm wondering, what, what the hell did he get 36 dates for basketball for? If I go back a little further, he was basically given an application. He filled out an application for an NBA franchise, and he was actually awarded the NBA franchise in 1961. They were, they were planning the, the expansion draft, um, you know, planning out where they would be in the, we probably would have gotten the first or second pick in the NBA draft and Harris had an agreement um, uh, for um, I'm having a mind freeze here. He was your coach in 1970, Charman, Bill Charman. Bill Charman. He had the agreement to have Bill Charman at 33 as a player coach for the franchise. It's all done. It's all set in the woods. All he had to do was keep his mouth shut and there's a chance that the penguins never happen what happens is uh red Auerbach, there's a rumor he's going to retire so walter brown who owns a team basically pulls the rug out of the deal uh, to send bill Sharman to pittsburgh as a coach because he if our uh retires he wants Sharman on his team so Instead of just sucking it up and finding another coach, John H. Harris is so irritated, so pissed off, that he pulls his application. Then, guy I, I believe uh, by the name of Litfield uh, is given the opportunity to, to resurrect the thing and take over the NBA team. But he makes the decision that because an NBA team would mean a losing team, and he could be on the ground floor of the American Basketball League by taking the Pittsburgh Wrens and being a competitive team, he was gonna take the Wrens in the ABL. How short-sighted was that? Unbelievable. But you know, here's the thing. If they get that franchise, an NBA franchise, I don't know that the city can support four major sports franchises. I don't think they can. I don't think they can, and I, and you know, let's say Bill Sharman ends up being a hell of a coach. Yes, 
Yes. So let's say by the mid '60s, it's not like any other sport. You need one or two good players. Look at drafting of Lou Alcindor, uh, uh, aka Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, turns Milwaukee from an expansion team who is basically sucks into a year later one of the best teams in the NBA, and a year after that the NBA champions. Right. So it could have happened. And with Bill Sharman, I think you have a winning team. Who are you? Is our fan base going to be more apt? Don't forget, Pittsburgh had – Duquesne was still a, a, a formidable program Absolutely. in the 1960s. Yep. So it, it is a basketball town at that point. And it becomes even more of a basketball town. And I think that not only Duquesne gets some of the – what do they call that? Uh, drafting, I guess you would call it, whenever you're sailing or whenever, wherever you're swimming. Yeah. They, they get some of that. And I think Pitt gets some of that as well. Absolutely. Don't forget Point Park. Point Park had a pretty decent program at that point too. Yes, they did through the seventies. So you know, but but do we? Get, I don't think that we get hockey. I think maybe you get the Hornets. Maybe they stay at AHL franchise. But I don't know that you have the thing. I'm not sure even that would have served. I, I I don't think it survives long because again, if you're in a, a town where the sports, I mean. We're not a huge town when compared to most markets. So four teams yeah. is tough even today. Back then, I, I don't know that the Hornets survived long. Probably I think not. It probably becomes a basketball town at that point, which you don't get a championship in 1968 in the ABA, in the first ABA. You don't get Connie Hawkins. You don't get Connie Hawkins. But we don't have a, uh, an NBA team. The what if was this guy screwed up. And Littman was very short-sighted in going for the ABL. So we eventually get a team called the Pipers in 1968. Don't draw well at first, but they're gaining momentum. They're starting to draw as they win the first a ABA title of all time. And that last game, they just about sell out. But what happens, Fletch? What happens at that point? Well, George Mikan, which, you know, it hurts me as a, as a lifelong Lakers fan to say that George Mikan is the devil. George Mikan is, is the, becomes the commissioner of the ABA, and one of the rules is that for him to, to be there, and one of his demands is that there needs to be a franchise where he is. So the Condors are packed off, and they're moved to Minnesota. They don't even get a chance, or the Pipers, rather. They don't even get a chance to defend their championship, Dave. They're gone. They come back later. They come back as the Condors. But by then, the damage is done. There's no momentum. There's no groundswell for a, a championship team there. And, and it's a bad team that comes back. The only good thing about it was John Brisker and his elbows and fighting. Um, well, and I, I've talked to Stu Johnson about him, who was one of the great uh, ABA players, I, I believe, if not the all-time three-point scorer in the top yes, three. He was the all-time three-pointer. Is he? Well, he, he, he told me that he said Brisker wasn't as bad a guy as you thought as people thought, but when he was on the floor, something went off. He, he, was, uh, um, he was a little nuts. But again, if, if you're going to end your career by being a mercenary in Uganda. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, that, I, that's still one of the most bizarre stories in sports. Oh, I, you know, it's there, true. There's recently an article, I think, in the Seattle Times about it, too, just talking about the John Brisker years and you know, how Bill Russell was his coach. I, I forgot that Russell went out there to coach. And oh, yeah, they, yeah. They did Absolutely. not get along. And the now, players, players thought that Britsker was going to try to fight Bill Russell. No, oh, he would have been crushed even. Even at that point of Bill's life, he would have been crushed. Uh, the well, ultimate team player, Dave. The ultimate was, team player. He was the ultimate team player. But, uh, you know, we had the Danny Russell story that turned out well for us after we legally uh, uh, said he was dead. Because uh, yes. we hadn't seen him in seven years. Uh, the victim of a pizza kiln accident. Uh, but, uh, but he returned to us. He did. I still remember the day of, of the, the, the Dan Russell uh, is, is alive. Wow. Oh. I was in tears. I was in tears when you called me. You were in the middle of your, your, your show. It's your radio, radio show. show. Yes, absolutely. Well, hopefully you you played uh, 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 the longest version of Free Freebird you could at that point. 
Oh, I had to play some. I had to play the jam because that was the that was Danny's band. Oh man, but you know, at least we had Connie Hawkins, who was a Hall of Famer. Indeed, but we didn't. Oh. We didn't. You know where I'm going with this. I know where you're going, Dave. Oh, and, and how Westmoreland County would be different. There's a man, Carl Mattioli. He was. Yeah, he unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, but he was the director of the Latrobe Historical Society. And uh, my cousin Tom and I did a, did a book on this, uh, this little subject about uh, 10 or 15 years ago and, and uh, had the pleasure to have many long conversations about Carl Mattioli over the fact that Latrobe should have had the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Had, Dave, I've seen the letter. I've seen the letter. Oh, it's, it's yeah, they had it. I mean, it was there. They had it for like 15 years. They got, there's even a letter we have in our book from Cooperstown congratulating them and, and giving them uh, ways. They had to raise the money because the NFL was nowhere near the cash cow it was. Right. Um, the big, they have a huge stadium for Latrobe High School. And people often wonder, why, why is this stadium so big? It's big because they built it for the Hall of Fame. There were actually NFL games played in that stadium um, before Latrobe had the chance to play in it. And it was supposed to be where the Hall of Fame was. They, they, had, they showed me the layout of, of what the Hall of Fame, it wasn't big to begin with, but it would have been huge as, as they grew up. But what they left on the table, and the reason they never got it, Fletch, was because too many people were afraid that it was going to bring tourists into town. Oh my God! Not tourists. Tourism. Not tourists willing to spend money. Not Tourism. tourists that help you get, build your infrastructure so that you can handle things like this. Oh my gosh! Fifteen years they couldn't raise money. I mean, they they had several um, big companies there. They they even had uh, I think it was Timken, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, yeah. but um, you know, here you have all these things. And they're fighting constantly about doing this. So the NFL gets pissed off and they put it back up. And Art Rooney is, is now one of the lone people who's fighting for Latrobe, who had their moment in time because John Brailier was the only man ever to admit from that era that he got paid to play football. Ten dollars in, in expenses to play football, which he claimed he bought a pair of pants with. And don't forget why, much. Well, well, it's not much. But how embarrassed are you? When well, luckily he died, so he didn't have to hear this. But in the in the 60s, you find out that a guy named Pudge Heffelfinger, three years earlier, who was it was heresy to be a professional football player to accept money. That's right, because the college game was king. It was king, exactly. So Pudge Heffelfinger accepted five hundred dollars to play in Pittsburgh a couple years earlier, as they found out later. So not only does Latrobe lose its, its Hall of Fame, but now, you know, its main claim is the birthplace of professional football, which they, the only thing they have to substantiate that is in 1897, they had the first all-professional team for, for a full year. So that's something at least. But Heffelfinger, you know, you even lose that. And what a businessman Brailler was, he gets his 10 bucks, Heffelfinger gets $500. To play one game, one game. Well, that, that tells you all you need to know about Latrobe, doesn't it? Exactly, exactly. This well, is they, they, it did give us two icons. It did give us Arnold Palmer and Fred Rogers. So yeah. something's in the water out there. Something's in the water there. But you know, the thing that would piss Mattioli off is the money he looks every time he looks at an article of what Canton makes every oh. year on pro football and why the city is. is I mean, it's it's. It's a city that's run down. And I, again, I'm wondering if I'm a citizen, what are you doing with the money? Because you make money hand over foot. Yep. That Hall of Fame there. And Mattiola used to get so pissed off thinking what that could have meant to Latrobe had they just put the Hall of Fame where it was supposed to be. It was there. Every other town that got a Hall of Fame found the money. Yes. And well, I mean, here's the thing, too. I mean, we've both been to Cooperstown. And it is, in my opinion, by far the best of all the halls. But 
I would still go to Cooperstown even without a Hall of Fame because it's a beautiful city because they've really embraced the tourism part of it. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you know, and you're not talking, you know, uh, uh, 2000 when they decided to embrace it. That was back in the in the late 30s. Right. Um, when they built that. And, and Think uh, what the Laurel Highlands could be even, I mean, it's a great destination now, but can you imagine what it would be with that it's Hall of Fame at Crown Jewel? It's it's just unbelievable, and and I mean there there's so much history for football even there even without this, I mean, you know, uh, you, you and and it's it's uh, it's a legitimate thing having the first all professional team, I mean you know that's something in there, but even in this area why we don't harness this the first all professional game most likely took place at a stadium that still exists off at field off the field right. Um, between uh, Latrobe and Greensburg in 1897. I mean, there are things we could still do and we're botching up uh, so many years later. Well, think about, think about the money. And, and I'm going to give you another what if that, that's, that, that turned out well for money. We're going to go back to a fight in 1994 with Michael Moore, a local fighter, yeah. undefeated at the time, beating George Foreman handily throughout the fight. Yeah, yeah. I, I looked up before we got here. I looked up the uh, scorecards. He had a five-point lead with two on two cards with uh, two rounds left. All he has to do is stay away. He doesn't, and we all know what kind of power Foreman had. Yeah. Foreman puts him down. Shortly after that fight, George Foreman signs a little endorsement deal with a small company to produce the George Foreman Grill. Dave. That is the second most lucrative marketing deal in sports history. The only one that tops it is Michael Jordan with Nike. If Foreman does not knock him out, does he get that endorsement? I don't know. I don't think. I don't think he gets it. I, I and, mean, what, and what of Michael Moore, who, you know, it wasn't a great time for heavyweights. We, you know, I think we can both agree on that. Right. But does he, he was what, 30? 34 now at the time, something like that? Yeah, yeah, something like that. What happens with his career? Because he's never the same after that fight. No, he isn't. I mean, the confidence that he has, the next stop would have been Lennox Lewis um, to unify, because this this was for two of the titles, plus the right. lineal. Oh, there it is. Yep. There yep. it is. The greatest of all heavyweight championships. Yes, indeed. And um, you're fighting Lennox Lewis next. And if I recall, and, and I know if Gary was here, he would, you know, be searching to put my balls on the uh, what's what's the name of the trophy? I don't know. The, on the league. Oh, oh, God! <laughs> the I, one I for last remember. place. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, anyways, he's, he's uh, he's uh, now it's gonna kill me the rest of the night. He's uh. Oh. He's going to put, I'm going to look it up here as, as, as we talk about this, but, you know, he's, he's going to um, put my eye on there. But I think more it is uh, a little bit more athletic than a Lennox Lewis, and I think he beats him. So, you know, you're, you're talking about a guy who could go through and be an undefeated God, I thought it'd be easier to find here, Fletch. It's, 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 it's an Indian name, Gary, or Dave. It's an Indian name. Oh, here it is. Here it is. The Sacco Trophy. The Last Sacco. Place, Sacco. The Sacco. That's right. So, um, you know, but I, I think he has a very good chance to go through if he's not selfish. And again, Michael Moore was not a, from what I recall, you know, I think he, he retires from boxing once he has enough money. I don't think the guy was was a passionate. No, his heart wasn't in. Yeah. He, he was a fixture down at the strip club. He would often take all of the uh, all of the ladies to the champagne room. Yeah, well, and good for him. He likes to give back for to him. the community. Yeah, you know, gives back to his people. But so, uh, I, so I've heard. So I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> but I. I think there's a better than even chance he beats Lewis. And then I think he retires at that point. He retires an undefeated heavyweight champion. So, like, yeah. 
Could have been you know, he's not the only Pittsburgh fighter who made that sort of mistake, too. But at least you can say with more. I, I think he got he got a nasty hit to the gut. So I'm not sure he was trying to knock out Foreman at that time. He wasn't staying away from him. That was the problem. No. But that's what caused him to eventually go down. This man, considered one of the top 10 uh, boxers of the 20th century, Billy Kahn, in a savage fight with, with uh, um, Joe Lewis, a heavy underdog, a much heavier underdog than, than George. Well, he was, but here's the thing. Billy Kahn was a light heavyweight. And he fought at that weight. He, he didn't go up and wait to, to, to fight no. Lewis. No. But he was faster than Lewis. He was outpointing him. It was, what, in the 13th round? All he had to do was stay away from a couple, for another couple rounds. His was pure ego. His was, it was. pure ego. He tried to knock him out. There's no way Lewis wins that fight if Khan just keeps doing the same thing. I, I mean, I, you know, I'm unsure of the Moore thing only because I can't quite recall whether that shot to the gut was him being cocky or just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Right. That wasn't an issue at all with Khan. No. No, he got it in, in his mind that he was going to be the man to knock out the Brown Bomber. I mean, you're, don't forget, Lewis was pretty much by himself by that point. It was not a, a great time for heavyweights. No. And if you're going to be fast enough to beat Joe Lewis, and again, to me, that's more impressive victory than somebody who, who throws a, a lucky hook and knocks out somebody. Right. But you yeah, it was, it was the speed difference, you know. Oh yeah, and you can't imagine anymore a, a light heavyweight fighting a heavyweight. No, no, and, and I think if and you're going into the war, so you're going to hold on to this title because remember their their rematch didn't take place for a few years because they both went into the war. Right, and it so, was and at the time that rematch it was the the highest grossing fight in history. Oh yeah, yeah, but you're. I mean, but both you're, of them were past their prime, and it was a, it was a bad fight from what I understand. Oh yeah, Con, Con got his ass kicked at that point. But if you're Con, you're holding on to the title for four years. All of a sudden, you know, you're one of the top five fighters, not one of the top ten, but one of the top five fighters in the 20th century at that point, with the and, greatest upset of all time. And Pitts, you solidify Pittsburgh's place in the boxing world. The Pittsburgh Absolutely. becomes even more of the uh, of the center that it was during that era and before. Sure, sure, because that's what uh, um, people forget about what Pittsburgh was like at a box as far as a boxing win in the first half of the 20th century. And and Roy McHugh has uh, shown us in his great book that um, he had just put out, and uh, one of our cohorts, Douglas Cavanaugh, who's uh, written uh, a couple books with us, um, and this. He is about to put out a book on, on Pittsburgh fighting uh, boxing history too, more of a biography thing than uh, what McHugh's was. But mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the championship talent that was in this area, and you're right, kids are inspired by Billy Kahn if he wins that fight. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, that's, but again, it's a beautiful thing about this whole what if thing. I mean, there's, sure. things are so close as it is. I mean, the, you know, you mentioned the Franco thing. You mentioned we mentioned post getting hit. You know, all those things by inches. Yeah, yeah. You're you're literally talking about. Look at Pittsburgh's the Pirates' last three World Series. 1979. You're down three games to one, and you decide to put in Jim Rooker, which I don't care to this day was a stupid decision. Um, that game was on TV today, by the way. I heard, I heard. How, how uh, was it just as fun to watch the second time? Oh, it was, it was fantastic. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell it you was what. so strange to see Three River Stadium back in the old configuration before they put the seats down on the field. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When you had the little window there behind home that. plate. Yeah, I love that. But, um, but you look at that. You, I mean, that never should have happened, the Jim Rooker thing. And Jim Rooker often said what turned the series around was in game five, they decided the scouts did such a bad job of scouting uh, the Orioles that they did the opposite and gave up, uh, what was it, three runs over the last uh, three games. Yeah. 
It was Costanza like. Dave, it was, it was like Costanza Dan like. So you have that. 71, Earl Weaver doesn't come down, out to calm down uh, Steve Blass. 1960, obviously there are several, several things about that that you could think that the Yankees, but the, Bill Mazeroski the doesn't the, the pebble that hit Tony Kubek in the throat. Exactly. They lose the game if that pebble doesn't go. And if, if they get out of the bottom of the ninth, I mean, Yankees are scoring a ton of runs every inning, and our pitching is depleted at that point. Yeah. So, you know, we got a pebble. We got Earl Weaver. And we got pure and simple luck. Yeah. Or else we're waiting since 1909. Or 1925, I'm sorry. In 1925, a driving rainstorm. If you choose, 99% of the time, you choose not to play that game. Right. You don't play that game. You get a fresh Walter Johnson. You don't win game seven. No. With a fresh Walter Johnson out there. But, you know, here's, here's the other thing. I mean, no pirate championship is ever easy. None. None. Absolutely. Absolutely. They were all seven-inning game, seven-inning championships. The only... Uh, uh, one that doesn't go at least seven games of all the series they're in is the sweep of the 27 Yankees. And even in that, don't forget, uh, they held out uh, with the, having a brain freeze on the manager at that point. Um, well, I just say he hates Kai Kai Kyler. And um, yeah. Look this up because I'm having a brain freeze. That's all right. I'm I'm out there with you. But yeah, they, they they held him back. You're right. But they um, ah Donnie Bush, Donnie Bush of course. Donnie Bush hates Kai Kai Kyler. He doesn't play him in the series, and they're two close games that a Kai Kai Kyler could have made a difference. Now I doubt they beat the 27 Yankees, but at least the series be becomes a little closer if, if you can capture a couple of games there by putting a Hall of Fame talent in, in you, something you, you, I think Bush eventually gets fired for losing a, a, a Kai Kai Kyler, and he should have. He deserves it. Um, I don't think I ever played that, that, that year in Stratomatic. Did you? No, no. It's a good team. It's a good team to manage. Yeah. Um, but um, – but you, you are seriously, there is no World Series that's easy for them. The only easy part of it was an 8 nothing win in, in the 1909 Game 7, the Babe Adams third, third victory. But, yeah. um, man, you're, you're, you're just inches away from not winning a series since 1909. And just weird twist of fates that all go in the Pirates' direction. Yeah. I mean, they, they've had their share of bad luck. Don't, no question yeah. about that. Oh, yeah. But, and we but won't, yeah, you're right. We won't get into the what if of 1992 because it's just going to eventually piss us off. Yeah. we're. I think that's a good place to close it, too. I don't even want to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'll give my FCC finger, uh, you know, to the Francisco Cabrera and the 92 Braves. But, uh, yeah. man. This is, I, I mean, this is the kind of stuff, there's so many more things we could talk about with this. Um, you know, but those are the key ones. Those are the big hitters. And, uh, the other one, okay, it's going to be in the same era, and we, we didn't talk about this one before, but I go back to the year before in 91. Was it 91? I think it was 91. Where Andy Van Slyke home run kicks off at the end? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that that because that '91 team was much better than '90 and '92. It was, it was. Yeah, I think was, it, was, it was the best team in baseball that year. Yeah, you know this this uh, what if thing is a cruel bitch. Let me just say it, that it's a cruel bitch. It's it's every bit as cruel. I mean, the one that gets me the most, to be honest with you, is, is the NBA team. I, I love NBA basketball. Oh, I, I love NBA too. basketball too. I mean, you would not be a Laker fan right now, and I would not be a Cavalier fan. Right. How do you just let a franchise go? I, I wouldn't have Wilt. Wilt's looking over my shoulder. He is. You're, you don't have Wilt there. You don't have Wilt there. And again, Bill Sharman. Bill Sharman is your coach. Yeah. 
I mean, he's he's the master from Red Arback. I mean, two times. That's that's two what ifs in Red Arback's career. You know, as I was doing research for the Chuck Cooper story, um, when Chuck Cooper leaves in 19, I think it's 1955 after that year, you know, he has some just bad arguments about playing time with Auerbach, so Auerbach sits him. But the season ends so disappointingly, Auerbach is on the hot seat and almost gets fired in 1955 before they win a title. He's this close away to being fired. Brown decides to keep him at the last minute. Wow. And, and then, of course, that. this in 1960 when he's talking about retiring. Um, you know, and as the, the cruel fate of that is he ends up not retiring and Sharman ends up getting screwed out of a head coaching job. Well, you know, the other thing, though, is that maybe if that happens, I don't have an ABA basketball in my youth. I don't get to see no. the spin of the ball. No, because Pittsburgh is not an ABA franchise. I mean, that would be foolhardily to uh, throw an ABA franchise in a small, smaller market when you have an NBA team. Happen. But on the other end, we have five Stanley Cup titles because of that. Pisses sure. me off at that, but I am certain the Penguins aren't here. Even if they get the franchise in 67, it's gone by 74. Well, yeah, I mean, there's the other one. What what if uh, they don't win the ping pong ball thing to get Sidney Crosby? They're gone. Quite possibly they are, yeah. They don't have the team to win. Yeah, absolutely. Although sometimes I wonder. I'm not a conspiracy guy, but sometimes I wonder if that if those – I don't always trust those cards and flips and ping pongs. and <laughs> You know, some of them just end up being too strange. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, Bettman once wanted Pittsburgh to keep his franchise, and he worked very hard. I, in fact, I think sometimes I don't think Mario pulls him out. I think he he plays hardball. But I often wonder if there's another commissioner there. As much as we complain about Bettman, he is a, a, a very much a force in making sure. I forget the guy from Hamilton, yeah, who was going to take over the team. But don't forget, he doesn't get the team because Bettman, he won't promise Bettman that he won't move him to Hamilton. That's right. So, you know, as much as we get pissed off at Bettman at times, we have a hockey team because of him and three more Stanley Cup titles. Yeah, he's fun to boo anyway. What the hell? It is. It is. But, oh, my, Fletch. This was a lot of fun, my friend. It was. Right now, uh, the other what if I, I'm thinking about is – what if I hadn't had that beer before we started? <laughs> what I need to go to the restroom as badly as I do right now. I don't know. You know what? I've I've had a I've, I've had a lot of water since I've come home, so I'm feeling I'm feeling with you, my friend. Oh <laughs> uh, well, I, I want to send this out to Gary. Gary, we miss you, buddy. We'll see you soon, buddy. We do, and try to stay within six feet of the toilet. There you go. All right. <laughs> there you go. All right, my friend. You have a good uh, good evening. You as well. <laughs>